Good morning. It's really wonderful to see a full house here today. Welcome. As the Dean of the Mendoza College of Business, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Tom Mendoza back to Notre Dame. Tom is a Notre Dame grad and recently retired as the Vice Chairman of NetApp, a company he joined in 1994 where he led the worldwide sales team. He was named President of NetApp in 2000 and created a workplace culture that ranked number one in Fortune Magazine's 100 best companies to work for. Today, NetApp is a Fortune 500 company bringing in one billion in revenue. Tom is a generous, generous philanthropist, giving to such causes as the Pat Tillman Foundation, St. Baldrick's Foundation, and the Navy SEAL Foundation. He's also on the board of Justin Tuck's Rush Foundation for Children's Literacy. Tom is a great leader and a wonderful friend to Notre Dame. It is my privilege to welcome him back to the college that bears his name. Please join me in welcoming Tom and Don. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. I met Martin about uh, a year ago. He was the temporary dean, whatever they call that. And uh, instantly I said, there's no doubt that's the right person. And those of you privileged enough to be in the business school, you know that you have a tremendous leader here. Very innovative, very creative, and I like. One of the things he did is he was already making changes and he didn't have the job yet. He said, I'm not gonna wait. That's, that's leadership, right, as opposed to. So I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about culture today. So when we started NetApp, just real quick, we grew from zero to a billion our first six years. We went from 200, from a startup, 250 million to a billion into hyper growth. Uh, the dot com bubble came. We were the third best stock in the history of the NASDAQ in the 90s. When the dot com bubble came, we were more exposed than any other company. We had a 650 PE ratio, the highest on the NASDAQ, which means you're going to fall further faster. And as much as you tell employees, don't check your stock on the way up, they check it twice as much on the way down. We went from 156 to six. Our market was tech, 70% technology. So that market had frozen with the dot-com bubble. And most people thought we would die. That's why your stock was down like that. We went from uh, a 250 million, a billion, 500 million, a billion, 800 million. And as an aside, going down 20% was not lethal in general in the market, but to us, not having seen it come, it was lethal. And in business and life, you find out if you got a friend when you got a problem. We had a big problem. And what will happen, if it hasn't happened to you yet, is people you think will step forward don't. People you never thought would do and your relationships change forever. You find out at that moment. And we found out we had a lot of friends. A guy called me, he was the number one headhunter, search guy in Northern California, and he said, for whatever it's worth, there's only two companies you cannot get people to leave right now, and that's Apple and NetApp. And what the people around the country did, around the world, is come to us and say, what can we do to bring this back? Now we knew. People told us we had a great culture in the 90s. If your stock goes up that much, everybody has a great culture. When your stock goes down, you find out who really is committed. So long story short, I became president that year. <laughs> kind of an interesting year to become president. Uh, we brought it back to three billion by 2010. It's six billion today. Um, it's been Fortune 500 for 10 years. So I, I announced my retirement from NetApp July 15th of this year for one month away. And I am on social media, for those of you interested, on LinkedIn and on Twitter. But I put it out on Twitter. I like to go through my message. But I got 1.1 million views the first day, which surprised me, and over 2,000 direct responses. And what the people talked about was the culture. And they talked about how it had changed their life. And they had never been able to find another culture. And I want to talk about that, because at the end of the day, People who run successful businesses will almost always agree that the culture of the company is what made it successful. And I would tell you this too, you can clearly 
make a lot of money by treating people poorly. You can clearly care about nothing but money and be successful. You can clearly rise to the top of our political system caring about nothing but yourself. We don't want to be that company. And I think that reflects Notre Dame's values. We wanted to be a company that people felt respected and appreciated at. And they came through for you, not because they're afraid, not because they're intimidated, they just did not want to let you down. I got that from my dad. And my dad was in World War II at 16. He doesn't have any education. My mother doesn't have any education. Father's father's from Cuba. Father's mother's from Ireland. Mother's parents were all from Czechoslovakia, first generation. They came here to make a better life for their kids. So I, I always felt that anything I did in life, my dad was there with me. And I, I just didn't want to let him down. That was the number one motivator for me, don't let him down. And that's what I believe we try to do as a company, as a culture, is make people want to come through because they don't want to let you down. So when we first got together, and I wrote this in the letter that day, we had our first offsite, two founders of the company. I've been brought in to bring the product to market. There were no sales yet. And the new CEO had been on, just joined. And we had an offsite. And he said, what is our mission? What are we here to do? And I've been in those meetings in other companies, and typically goes to revenue targets, Fortune 500, go public, different things like, we didn't talk about any of that. What we said is we want to create a company we'll be proud of the rest of our lives. We want to be proud of it. We want the people who work here to be proud of it. We want the people who buy from us to be proud of it. We want the people who partner with us to be proud of it. And that informed every decision we made. It's a very different way of building a company, is to make sure that you're living your values. And that worked out spectacularly well. So after six years, as I mentioned, we wanted a high performance culture, by the way. It's not like, we are the world. It's not one of those type of things. It's very high performance culture. I find that people who are really committed want to be around other people who are too. I've, I've spoke for the Marine Corps at Quantico during Fallujah. Spoke at West Point in 2009, spoke for the Mossad in Israel. The West Point one's on YouTube if you're interested. And the reason I get asked to speak, they understand what I'm talking about extraordinarily well. And there's lives that are gonna be lost because of we're not committed together. Um, so we wanted a high performance culture where people felt respected, appreciated, and were given freedom to make mistakes as long as they don't do it too many times. But if you're not free to make mistakes, you just won't do anything. So, dot-com bubble, our stock's plunging, and we enter this thing called the Great Place to Work survey. Great Place to Work is a uh, confidential survey among your employees globally, and we, we did it in America first. Our goal was to be a great company everywhere we did business. So we did it in America. As your stock's going like that, it's a hard time. How you doing? <laughs> it's a rough time. And we were voted the 43rd best company in America to work for. Surprises. And then we're in the top 10 for 12 straight years. We were number one in America in 2009, and we've been number one in over 15 countries. That's a very, very, and, and with the success followed that. I believe success in numbers should come because you're doing the right things, not because you just tried to get the money. If you just focus on the money, you'll do the wrong things, in my opinion. So I'd like to just tell you what the culture of that is. And then I want to share a story about I was speaking in NC State, and during the Q&A, somebody said, what's the proudest moment of your life? Not everybody knows that answer instantaneously. I do, and it had to do, started in this auditorium 19 years ago. So I want to share that story with you, because see, I haven't ever told it in public that I know of outside of the answering that question. And then we'll open it to questions. So as we grew, and we, you know, when you grow from 250 million to a billion, you're hiring people so fast, it's very important that you can say what your culture is. I don't talk about values because values, I, I, get, I spoke at IASA, a business school in Spain, and they said, could you bring a chart of your values? I had to go look them up. <laughs> Obviously, it wasn't driving my behavior. Fortunately, it matched what we did. But, I, but culture is the behavior you witness when you deal with an organization. Football team has a culture. Anything has a culture. And oh, by the way, 
Not only are you going to start a company, obviously, whatever company you join will have a culture. You hope it's a healthy one. When you look for a company, you might want to find that out. Whatever group you're in is going to have a culture. And you want to be a part of driving that culture to a healthy place, because that's where you work every day. So I would go around the world, and the only requirement I had, I never flew under 250,000 miles my first 20 years at NetApp. I flew 375 my last year as president. 25,000 circumvents the globe. And my one requirement was that we'd have an internal meeting and I'd talk about culture. And the reason is that's how we stay on the same page. You're bringing people in so fast. If you don't say what it is, they could come in from very different cultures and your, your culture will change because you didn't work at it. So there are five things in our culture that we care about. Number one is attitude. Nothing great has ever been done by people that didn't want to do it, ever. You think about anything you really, really want to do, and you probably can get very, very good at it. And if you don't really want to do something, you probably should go find something you want to do. Second thought on attitude is, that's how you judge people the most in the, mar in the workplace. If I ask you, what do you think of Dan? You're not gonna tell me Dan had this degree or Dan did that. You're gonna tell me whether Dan has a great attitude. Oh, he's a great teammate. You can depend upon him. That's what you want people to say about you, and that's totally in your control. Every day, you wake up and decide how the world's gonna look at you. And I have yet to hear the benefit of a bad attitude. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> you wanna light up a room with positivity when you're taking on a challenge. That's my advice. Second, by the way, I don't work around bad attitudes. I work around a lot of things. I will not work around a bad attitude. I give a talk in uh, Pebble Beach, California to a company called CSC. And the guy says to me, I have this great guy, he's probably the best technical person we have, but everybody hates working for him. He doesn't show up to meetings unless he chooses to. If the material's not something he's interested in, he just walks out. Doesn't care about anybody but himself. Now, let's face it, this isn't a hard conversation what to do here. He says, so what would you do? I said, well, I'd have a talk with him, tell him he's, he'd better change this or you're gonna change him. He goes, wow, he's, he's really, really a strong personality. Okay. I said, who's he work for? Me. Well, this is a direct reflection on you to those people that it's okay to walk out of meetings, it's okay. So two weeks later, he called me and said, I gotta tell you, that was the worst advice anyone has ever given me in my life. And I thought you should know that. I said, wow, that's interesting. What happened? He got pissed, he ran out of the building, said he doesn't want to work here anymore. I said, how'd the other people react? Well, they were thrilled. <laughs> no, just, just saying. And then he called me about two weeks later and he said, yeah, I can believe what happened. He cooled down, he came back, we made him an individual contributor, he's thrilled, and now I put somebody in and the group's thrilled, and now we're a team. You cannot have a bad attitude as your leader and not pay bad, bad results. Number two is candor. And this is the one where I get to speak in organizations. Many times lower level people in the company go, I wish I could tell my bosses the truth. Why is candor important? Candor is telling the truth at the moment it counts. We're in a meeting together, and you don't think this is true. And this has to be driven top down. You have to, this is the essence of a healthy culture, though. The people closest to the problem will give you the best input. And if they can't tell the truth to the people running the company, you're making decisions on false information. So Dan Hesse is a very well-known alum here, and he asked me to come speak at Sprint. That was one screwed up place, I'll tell you. So anyway, <laughs> I spoke to the lower level guys, like, oh my God, we wish we could tell them, there's, there's so many things we could do better for our customers, but if I bring that up, it's a negative. And then I met with the group that was responsible for that, and uh, the leaders, and I said to the guy, do you think you have good candor? Oh, we have great candor. He goes, I say anything I want. <laughs> That's not candor. Candor is being able to take input from your employees what can we do better? What is it that you think we should do better? No matter what they say, take it right, and then use, you don't have to do everything, but if, we, if we're making a decision, and you voice your opinion, even if I don't do it, the fact that we talk it through, and a decision's made you feel 100% better, I believe if people feel part of the decision, 
you have ownership of it, you execute it at a completely different level than if you just sit there and do what somebody tells you to do. And oh, by the way, you do not go far in your career by sitting there and letting somebody tell you what to do and not having an opinion. Best employee we ever had at NetApp, Suresh Fosterdaven. He's gone on to be the CEO of two and now his third company. And one day we were in a meeting and was saying, we had three different challenges. Who should we give it to? Suresh Vasudevan. He was not a high level guy at the time. And the new head of HR said later, and none of the things reported to what he was doing. What is it about Suresh? We should hire more Suresh. This is advice. If you take this seriously, good things are going to happen. And I answered, I said, there's three things about Suresh. Number one, he was in biz dev to start. He ended up as vice president of engineering. We, we considered making him CEO at 36 years old. He thought it was too big and he wanted to do two other companies that he's since sold. But this, he's 28 now when this conversation is happening. So number one, when he came in the door, he took a very broad view of our business. Businesses don't keep it a secret what they're trying to do. So I think it's a mistake to get in and just know your job. Of course you want to know your job, but you should know broadly what's the company trying to accomplish and is there something you can do to make it happen. The second thing he did, he's very good on what's called cross-functional teams. In a big organization, a lot of people can run some of everything reports to them. But if you've got to work with other groups and, and do it through influence, that's a skill. And if you can do that, every meeting he attended came out better than it would have if he didn't show up. And the third and most important part for the students in the room, whatever challenge we gave them, what we would say is it came back better than we expected. We're not looking for miracles. But if you handed Suresh that challenge, you didn't even think about it again. And it would come back better than you expected. You're on a rocket ship if, if in a closed room people say that about you because they'll come up with new things for you to do, and that's what you want in your career. You constantly want new challenges that you can help the company, and up you go. The third part of our culture, I wanted a positive culture, so I started a statement, catch someone doing something right. Now, of course, if there were things wrong, we would talk about them. But more importantly, if people are gonna give you their heart and souls, give you everything they got, you gotta make sure they, they understand that you respect that and appreciate it and know about it. Worst feeling in the world is to think, does anybody care about me here? So I started to say, catch someone doing something right. It is built into the culture of NetApp. And what it is, that we started to grow very fast and I said, I can't see everybody anymore. If you see somebody that does something extraordinary to help NetApp, to help a customer, to help a partner, to help society. We, at the beginning of the company, we came out with a program, one week's vacation if you work for a charity, paid by us. Just do whatever you want, no questions asked, go help somebody. But tell me the story. And so I would call, and I'd make about 10 calls a day to tell people. My friend Bill McDermott is the CEO of SAP, and he called me up and he said, Tom, it was written up in a book by Susan Anunzio. She's a PhD professor at the University of Chicago called Contagious Success. And she, he says, Tom, how do you find the time? I said, Bill, 10 calls a day. How long do you think these calls last? Somebody said to this, hello, Joe, Tom Mendoza. <sighs> they're, not, they're not hoping for that call. They go, oh, Jesus, what, what, what next? And I go, I, I just want to tell you, I heard you did this, this, and this. You drove to an account that's not even your account. You help somebody, it's not even, there's nothing in it for you. I just want to tell you how much we appreciate that. They never keep that a secret. And people ask them why, and now you're building a culture. People want to know why. Now, when I spoke at West Point in 2009, on the way there, I just spoke at Stanford on Tuesday, and I'm going to West Point, talking about different crowds. These guys are all gonna make their first million. These people are all going to Afghanistan in 90 days. That was the crowd. 43 cadets selected by the 4400s, the next great generation of leaders. It was Secretary Gates in the White House the day before. And they, and they said to me, final question, best question I've ever been asked. Mr. Mendoza, how many people are in NetApp when you joined? I said, 32. And the young man smiled and he said, for whatever it's worth, Everyone you're speaking with is going to have 32 people reporting to them in Afghanistan within 90 days. That's a unit. 
And whether they live or die will depend upon the decisions we make. What's your advice for us? Cloud computing. No. <laughs> I mean, it was so far away from where I normally was. Like, Whoa. I knew that wasn't the right answer, but it ran through my mind as a joke, but I didn't do it. It wasn't really a joking moment, if you know what I'm saying. But I said to him, 30, so look, I, I haven't been in your shoes. I hope not many people will have to. Imagine we're still there 10 years later, by the way. And I said, 32 people. It's not a lot of people. Ask yourself this question about every one of them. What's their hopes? What's their dreams? What's their aspirations? You should know that. If you know that, they know you care about them. They certainly know it. Number two, don't ask them to do something you wouldn't do. And lastly, I thought it's on the spot, it's been quoted a lot there, Bernie Banks runs leadership there, he's now at Kellogg, but Bernie was sitting in the front row, and I said, if it's between them coming home alone, alive, or you coming home alive, they gotta know they're coming home. They were silent for 10 seconds, snapped into a salute and walked out. And this guy named Joey Santamarini, he's coming to the game today, Dan knows him well here. Joey was filming the whole thing, and we get in the car and we drive back to New York, one hour drive. Jesus and the fishes, my uncle picking up a check, and me and Joey not talking for an hour. That would be the three miracles. <laughs> we were dead silent. And both of us looked at each other. Have we ever been together for an hour and nobody talking? No. It was amazing. Leadership rather than management is the fourth point of the culture. Of course we need you to manage, but leadership is what makes the world go round. Teddy Roosevelt once said, and this this is my style of leadership, which is people don't care what you know unless they know that you care. They just don't. Think about somebody you would willingly do anything for. No questions asked. There's a deep relationship of care there and trust that you've created. So that's my point about going and leading from the front. Before you ask back, go create value at the point of attack. And then when you ask back, people will do it because they don't want to let you down. Two points of leadership. I'd like to highlight aspiration and inspiration. Most people, in my opinion, their life and business aspire too low. You gotta shoot high. You don't wanna be somebody who always hits goals. You wanna be somebody who sets such high goals, sometimes you're gonna miss, but when you hit them, they're gonna be unbelievable. And that's the life you want. You want that life. You know, I came, my parents neither of them made it out of high school. <laughs> when I gave the gift to Notre Dame, I was a very impressive kid. I don't mean to digress, but it's very, very impressive. And uh, all these people wrote, these whack jobs wrote me money. Can you send me 50 grand? You must have it. You gave it to them. Can I have some? So I had all these letters. And then this woman from Long Island, I grew up in Long Island, Newsday. So I read in the Newsday that you gave all this money to Notre Dame. No, she didn't say that. She said, a guy with your name who appears to be your age from my high school. Dear Tom, you may not remember we went to fifth grade together. That's how it started. Pink Floyd concert, I don't remember fifth grade. But anyway, so, so now we're talking, right? Somebody, your name, appears to be your age, from our town, gave all this money to Notre Dame. You should meet him, you might be related. <laughs> that was very impressive. So with all that information, the one thing she knew was not this guy. At the end of the day, other people don't expect that much out of you. I don't know if you can grow up in a neighborhood where people don't think much of people going like that. I had no history in my family of college or anybody else I knew going to college or anybody attaining anything other than getting a job, not being on the dole at home. And I had to break out of that myself. I had to say, you know, how do these people who do great things do it? The first thing is you have to aspire to great things and challenge yourself constantly. Don't settle. And then inspiration, as I talked to you about, I'll give you a, a, a thought on inspiration. It's offered the most when it's needed the least, and it's offered the least when it's needed the most. When you've won, you'll get a lot of phone calls. You won, you won. That's not inspiration. When you're in the struggle, you're at school and you're struggling with school, you're playing a sport and you're hurt, you're in a job and I didn't give you enough resource and I gave you too high a goal, you have health problems, someone in your family is sick, the reason I wanted people to tell me about this is so I could call and say, is there anything we could do? What, those are the calls I remember for the rest of their life, not when they won, and that's inspiration. 
looking to lift somebody up who needs it at the moment they need it. The last part of our culture is embracing change. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. If you're staying the same, you're getting worse. And as an individual, you constantly have to ask yourself the question, what am I getting better at? It's not somebody else's job to assign it. You got to pick it and you got to get better at it. So Dr. John Cotter is from Harvard, the most published professor at Harvard ever, in a Harvard Business Review. I hired him for five years to consult with us on change when we were winning. He said Southwest Airlines and NetApp were the only two to do that. And so he gave me an observation. 80% or more of companies or people that set out to change fail. 80%. That's probably low. Now, why is that? Because they cannot sustain a sense of urgency. You know, when you have to change, and it's very, very clear, you change. But then it gets better, and change stops. The other thing that he concluded, he has a book, A Sense of Urgency, but later he concluded a thought that really drove my management style. He said, most change is built around what they call a burning platform. If you don't do this, you're screwed. If you don't do this, we're in big, big trouble. If that's true, it's OK, but that's not sustainable. No one gets up in the morning, I got to go to work, because otherwise I'm screwed is not great. But what's the alternative to that? What's the big opportunity? That's why you should change. And it's a leader's job to explain, we're going to go through all this kind of stuff, but here's where we're going. Here's that opportunity, and that's why people change. So let me tell you the story, the answer to what's the proudest moment of my life. So my 1994, I started that up, my mother passed away. Shockingly, 67, heart attack, didn't see it come. We always thought my dad would go first. A lot of early death on that side. So anyway, now fast forward, and I've just endowed the business school. And they asked me to have a two-day celebration. I was like, I didn't, I felt self-conscious, but they're no, we like people to think this is a good idea. <laughs> I think they were part of it. Anyway, so my dad comes with me. And my dad got claustrophobia late in life. And he had a panic attack on the way here. He's like, look, it's going to be too intense. It's all going to be... I don't want it to be your day. I don't want to ruin it, but I, I, I can't be there. And I had endowed a scholarship right after my mother died, a, a scholarship in my dad's name with three conditions, a full ride for somebody. Number one, uh, I said, I don't care if they're black, white, green, yellow, man, woman, it's got to be the kid's dream to go to Notre Dame. It's like one day after my mother died. They go, OK, number two. So if they say, I'm going to consider it, you screwed up. Number two. They're a perfect candidate for this school, have everything but money. And you're going to call them and say, somebody they never met is going to take care of that. And they said, what's number three? They got to write my father a letter every semester. And they wrote lots of letters. And so that morning, he was going to meet the six kids who had been writing them letters. And that's when he had the panic attack. And I said, look, we'll go there. And if something's wrong, we'll just leave. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'll tell the school, I'm sorry, we'll just go home. He's in there 10 minutes, they walk right by me, and they'll, they have a relationship with him. Our lady's like, I said, Dad, you want to go? No, go ahead, I'm good, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so, so I spoke at the football luncheon, Urban Meyer was the other speaker, oddly enough, he was an assistant here, and then we came on this stage, and I was the final speaker. I haven't been here more than once or twice since, so this is an interesting thing. To, Warren Buffett was in the back row, as it turns out. We were playing Nebraska. Condoleezza Rice was sitting right there, Jack Welsh, Larry Bossidy, and a lot of students. And, but not my dad, of course. My dad, did, he was behind where you guys are. He couldn't, he didn't want me to see him. He's over there somewhere. And I said, I was the final speaker, I said, three things happen to yourself in life. Consider yourself fortunate. Number one, you're born in or you live, get the opportunity to live in this country where you can have this happen to you. Because I'm very well aware if I was in Afghanistan or something, it wouldn't have mattered if I had vision or dreams. Number two, if you have parents who tell you you can. I had nothing but positive support from my parents. And I, I, I'm so grateful for that now, because I saw other kids who didn't have it. But it never, you know, and then number three, if you have somebody in your life who wakes up every day and your happiness means more to that person and you feel the same way, 
And I, I definitely have that. I had my life then. I definitely have it in my life now. And there's a strength and a belief by just having somebody who you know, you know has your back. And then I said, and I have to do this. I know it's going to piss him off, but I said, we've only got one living relative here, my dad, and he does not want to come up here. But I got to bring him out. And he had to drag him out from there. And he stood here. And those people applauded for 10 minutes. And they were all crying. And I was crying. And, and, and as I walked out, I remember Larry Bossidy saying, that was a Notre Dame moment. That was unbelievable. And the next day, we walked the flag out. My dad walked the flag out for the national anthem. He presents it to the Irish guard. My, he, he enlisted in World War II at 16. So I mean, he's a four-year veteran. And the flag goes halfway up. They just announced the gift. 80,000 people are roaring. The flag goes up, and three Mirage fighters went right over us. I went, they got it. <laughs> they started here, and it ended there. So I just close by saying one of the great honors of my life has been to be involved with this school. It, it changed my life. Uh, and so many young people from here have taken the time to tell me what it's done for their lives. And uh, I just ask that everybody here that has the opportunity to be here make the most of it. This is a unique place. You'll never regret having taken the most out of it, not just grades and work, the relation, my, my freshman roommate, which is 50 years ago this month, was my best man at my wedding five years ago. It's still my best friend in life, and I'm sure that'll happen to you. Thank you very much.